All right, welcome back. Let's dive in with our first question. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, the correct answer here is A. So what we're going to do now is look at the uh, protozoal infection. So we've got Giardia, Entamoeba, Histolytica, and Cryptosporidium. So first let's look at Giardia lamblia. So this is going to be transmitted via cysts in the water, and this leads to that classic bloating, flatulent, and, and foul-smelling diarrhea. And classically, um, they might say that it floats in the water, and that's indicating that it's fatty. That's basically what they're trying to get across to you. Now, the classic scenario here with Giardia is that hiker who drinks from a stream and then ingests these cysts. So animals go into the water, uh, you know, they spread fecal matter through the water, you ingest the cysts, you get Giardia. Now, on microscopy, they, these will appear as these multinucleated trophozoites, or you can even identify cysts in the stool. So watch for either micro or, you know, something we see in, this, in, the, in the actual stool, okay? So, um, you know, not a lot there, but very high yield, so make sure you keep in mind the main findings of Giardia. Now, you're going to treat this with metronidazole. Now, next up, we have Entamoeba histolytica. This is going to be responsible for causing amoebiasis. Now, that's characterized by bloody diarrhea, right upper quadrant abdominal pain, as well as liver abscess formation. Now, this, just as with Giardia, is transmitted via cysts in the water. So if you look at the cysts in the stool, you can see up to four nuclei. And one unique feature of our diagnosis is the presence of engulfed red blood cells. Now, the way we treat this is with metronidazole, but if they're not symptomatic, we can use other drugs like iodoquinol or paromomycin. Next up, we've got cryptosporidium. This is going to be a cause of severe diarrhea in AIDS patients or mild diarrhea in a healthy immunocompetent patient. Now, you can differentiate this from the other two by the fact that this one is transmitted by oocysts in the water, not cysts. You can diagnose this by identifying the oocysts on acid fastane or by finding antigens. Immunocompetent patients can be treated with a drug known as nidazoxamide. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is E. So let's start our discussion about CNS infections due to protozoa with Negleri fallery. This is a cause of a rapidly fatal meningoencephalitis, and that's caused by the organism getting through the cribriform plate while swimming in infected freshwater. Freshwater, keep that in mind. Now we can diagnose this by identifying the presence of amoebas in the CSF. And although it is fatal very rapidly, if we catch it possibly early enough, Amphotericin B will be the best bet to try and save your patient. Next up, we have Toxoplasma gondii. Now, this is transmitted by cysts in meat, as well as by oocysts in cat feces. That is why pregnant women should be cautious about cleaning cat litter throughout their pregnancy because that can cross placenta and it can lead to congenital toxoplasmosis. Now, that is going to be characterized by the classic triad of chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, as well as intracranial calcifications. Now, in immunocompetent patients, this looks similar to mononucleosis, but there will be a negative heterophile antibody test, and that's how you can differentiate from it um, on your exam. Now, those with AIDS can demonstrate multiple ring-enhanced lesions on MRI. Now, diagnosis can be made with serology or by identification of the tachyzoite on biopsy. How do we treat this? With a combination of sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine. Now, the next one here is Trypanosoma brucei. That's our final CNS-related protozoal infection. This is acquired by being bitten by the tsetse fly, and this leads to a condition known as African sleeping sickness. Now, this is characterized by somnolescence, of course, lymphadenopathy, a recurring fever, and even coma. Now, diagnosis can be made by identification of the tripomastigote in the blood smear. If this penetrates into the CNS, we can treat the patient with melarsoprol. If it doesn't, we can treat with suramin. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is C, Plasmodium falciparum. Okay, the two hemologic infections that we're gonna cover are of course the Plasmodium species, which causes malaria, 
and then Babesia, which causes Babesiosis. Babesia, as I mentioned, causes a condition known as Babesiosis. That is characterized by fever and hemolytic anemia, and severe cases can even lead to asplenia. Now, this will be transmitted via the exodes tick. Now, do you remember what else is transmitted via the exodes tick? If you said Borrelia burgdorferi, you are right. It is also the vector for anaplasma. Okay, just a side note there. Now, diagnosis for uh, Babesia can be confirmed with the presence of a ring form or the classic Maltese cross. And you're going to treat this with atovaquone plus azithromycin. Next, we have the plasmodium species, which include plasmodium vivax, ovale, uh, falciparum, and malaria. So let's go through each one now. This is transmitted, of course, by the Anopheles mosquito, and these are all really important, so make sure you know these. Now, as an overall theme, remember that malaria is characterized by fever, by headache, by anemia, and by splenomegaly. Now, plasmodium vivax and ovale are characterized by a fever on a 48-hour cycle, meaning their fevers are 48 hours apart. Fever, 48 hours, fever. Now this is also characterized by the possibility of a dormant form in the liver. Plasmodium falciparum is characterized by severe, irregular fever patterns. And we can also see something caused by this, this um, organism, uh, something known as cerebral malaria, and that's caused by the occlusion of capillaries in the brain by parasitized red blood cells. As well, this can cause occlusion in the lungs and the kidneys. Okay, now the last type here is plasmodium malaria. That is characterized by a 72-hour cycle of symptoms. Again, easy way to identify can be based on the cycle time. On blood smear, remember we're going to see a trophozoite ring form within the red blood cells, a schizont containing merozoites, and red granules throughout the red blood cell cytoplasm in both ovale and vivax. That is known as Schuffner stipling. The treatment should include the use of chloroquine for sensitive species. Now, if the case is severe and life-threatening, we can turn to IV quinidine or artesunate. Now, for ovale and vivax, we're going to add primaquine for the hypnozoite. Now, just as a side note, if we give artesunate or primaquine, we first want to test for a glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Keep that one in mind. Now, a few more protozoa that I want to cover include the Trypanosoma cruzi, Leishmania, and Trichomonas vaginalis. So let's just go over those now. Now, Trypanosoma cruzi causes Chagas disease. That's a condition that's characterized by dilated cardiomyopathy with apical atrophy, megacolon, megaesophagus, and unilateral periorbital swelling in the acute stage. Now, this periorbital swelling is known as rheumatocyte. And this is transmitted by the triatamine insect, and this is also known as the kissing bug. Now, the way this transmit is by biting and then defecating around the mouth, the eyes, or both, which I know that's gross sounding. And this leads to transmission of the feces right into the bite or the mucosa. Diagnosing this will be through identification of the tripomastigotes right in the blood smear. And you're going to treat this with either uh, benzonidazole or nifertamox. Then we have Leishmania or Leishmaniasis, and this is transmitted via the sandfly, and this can cause a visceral or cutaneous condition. Now, if cutaneous, it's going to be characterized by skin ulcers. If visceral, it can cause spiking fevers, pancytopenia, and hepatosplenomegaly. Now, this is also known as Cala Azar, and we can diagnose this by identifying the amastigotes within the macrophages. Now, how do we treat this? Either with amphotericin B or sodium stiboglucanate. And finally, we have the sexually transmitted protozoa that you need to know, super high yield, that is Trichomonas vaginalis. This causes a greenish discharge that is foul smelling, and it's also characterized by burning and itching in the vaginal area. Now, this of course is transmitted sexually, and we can diagnose this with the clinical features I just mentioned, uh, the physical exam, which will show a strawberry cervix, and by identification of motile trophozoites on wet mouth. And we treat this with metronidazole. Now keep in mind that if you're asked, you also do need to treat the partner. All right, let's do one more question in this particular lecture. Go ahead and hit that pause button, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is C, schistosoma hematobium. So the worms are important, but I don't want you to waste too much of your time going over this because in reality, you will likely get way more questions from bacteriology and virology than you will about worms. So let me give you a quick review of the highest yield facts you need to remember. So let's just do this in a quick Q&A format. 
I'm going to give you a sign or symptom. You tell me which worm is responsible. So let's get started. Question number one, perianal itching. Which worm is involved? The correct answer is enterobius. Question two, which worm is associated with seizures and cysts in the brain? Correct answer is tinea solium. Remember, this is transmitted by ingesting larvae that are insisted in undercooked pork. Question three, liver cysts. I know that's not a lot, but the answer is echinococcus granulosus. Remember, this is transmitted by ingesting eggs in food that's contaminated with dog feces. Question four, hematuria, squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder, and pulmonary hypertension. This one's easy. This was the topic of this question, schistosoma hematobium. Question number five, portal hypertension. The answer is schistosoma mansoni. Question six, causes a B12 deficiency. Correct answer is, this is this one's always on everyone's mind, it's super high yield, diphilobothrium latum. Question seven, can cause a microcytic anemia. There's two. We have ankylostoma and nectar. Question eight, can cause a cholangiocarcinoma. Can cause cholangiocarcinoma. The answer is clinorchis sinensis. And the last one here, can cause myalgia and periorbital edema. This one's also very commonly seen. The answer is trichinella spiralis. Remember, this is also going to be transmitted by undercooked pork. So the big takeaway for the exam, make sure you know these high yield worms. The big takeaway for your life is please do not serve people undercooked pork. All right, I'll see you on the next lecture.